Hi, my name is Glenn Morgan. Thank you for watching. This is We The Governed. And uh, today's video, this is going to be, I'm very excited because I have in the studio with me today the opportunity to interview one of our favorite representatives in Washington State and a good friend of Liberty and Freedom, Representative Walsh from the 19th Legislative District. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for being here today. Great to be here, Glenn. It's always a pleasure to uh run down the list of the good, the bad, and the ugly in Olympia with you. <laughs> well, I, uh, I know one of the things we were talking about before the show here was that we wanted to discuss, we, we've had some conversations in the past about this inevitable building uh, red wave that uh, people are talking about all across the country and even here in Washington State. And so you and I have talked about this a little bit, and I just th think that uh, the listeners uh, would be really interested in uh, a discussion about what this red wave might mean in Washington State. Well, it means something for sure. There's always the question uh, when there's a wave, red, blue, whatever, mm -hmm. when there's a wave election, does it reach the West Coast? Mm -hmm. Does it reach Washington State? And sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, does it get over the Cascades? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. It right, reaches right. Washington State, but not over the hills. Yeah. Um, so uh, what's going to happen this time? There's some historical precedent mm -hmm. for what we're seeing in 2022. Mm -hmm. Really, the clearest historical uh, reference is 1994. Right. In that year, there was a, a red wave that did reach over the Cascades mm -hmm. and really changed the way that the state government operated for a couple of years. Right. And uh, and in many of the markers, it's it's an it's a midterm election after a new president was elected. Some of the economic potentials for recession that are out there we're seeing mm -hmm. line up like they did in 1994 right. here in 2022. So there's there's good reason to, to expect that the wave will reach uh, Washington this year and we, we could see some good reforms in Olympia. So I'm optimistic. Now, I know one of the things, uh, because uh, we tend to be on the liberty freedom side of things, you're an elected Republican. I'm a Republican PCO, and, and I'm a conservative activist around the state. So I, we tend to sometimes paint this in partisan brushes, uh, Republicans in office, Democrats in office, and that's a reflection of what the red wave is or not. And uh, But I oftentimes will, I know I, I sometimes try to do, is get information from people who completely disagree with me, if I can, and get a sense of what their perspective is on what's going on. And I, I think in addition to the polling that seems to support this tendency of uh, a lot of people being upset with the status quo and wanting to change how they're voting this cycle or some percentage of those voters. It was really interesting to me talking to some of my contacts on the Democrat side and hearing these uh, just kind of depressed approach to the elections this cycle and even a general uh, willingness to admit that they're going to lose a lot of seats in both the state Senate and the state House this cycle and that uh, their most optimistic um, uh, ideas of what the election are gonna, is going to look like in November is uh, really pretty positive for the Republicans. And even uh, this whisper behind the scenes, admittedly, that they're going to lose control or lose con you know, their perception of control over the state government. Um, what's your impression on that when you, you, know, you hear and you're traveling around the state a lot just like I am? So. Yeah, there's, it, these things operate on a couple of levels. Uh, of course, most people don't think about politics all the time. Right. And if we do our jobs as legislators, we're supposed to relieve them of that. They don't right. have to think about it all the time. We're thinking about it for them. They hire us to do that. So most people think about politics in a, in, in, in a kind of uh, patchwork way. There are a few issues they really care about, and, and, and the rest of the time they're, they're, they sort of trust the system to work. Mm -hmm. Maybe they shouldn't, but they do, right. uh, and they hope that it works. Mm -hmm. So that kind of casual approach, that kind of uh, uh, more limited uh, interest in politics, those are your swing voters. Those are the people that all politicians, all political parties, they're always looking for. And that's, How to that's kind of that them. middle 30% right. or something. In 30 the... or 40%, depending where you right. are. Um, and they, by, by polling and by anecdotal research, that middle portion of, of the population, mm -hmm. they, they don't like what's going on. And they right. want change. And here in Washington, that means uh, a new party in charge. Right. Now, that's what we're normal people are. Mm -hmm. Inside the political world, there's more of a cultural issue going on. Mm -hmm. um, basically, for the past generation, almost two generations in Washington State, we've had one side, the Democrat side, the more liberal side, mm -hmm. that just 
doesn't know how to lose. They they just win. They win. Yeah, they presume, presume presume victory to win. is coming. Yeah. And the other side, the conservative side, the Republican side, basically doesn't know how to win. It's the opposite culture. Yeah. And and they 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 start from a position of well, can we mitigate the loss right. rather than can we actually win uh, an issue or right. an election? So. Someone's going to learn a lesson this year. Right, right. Uh, yeah, someone's going to learn how to win. Someone's going to learn how to lose. And, yeah, and, yeah. And, and it may be that that this cultural perspective changes, mm -hmm. and and that's what I hope as someone mm -hmm. who's working inside the the policy world or the sausage factory, as we say about mm -hmm. Olympia. I'm hoping for that cultural change inside that, and, and I think this will be healthy for for everyone, those people who don't think about politics that much, that there's a change up. That the ones who don't know how, how to win, win. The ones who don't know how to lose, lose. And maybe get a little uh, humility. They learn a little humility. Right. And, uh, and maybe the ones who were lost for so long, maybe they gain a little confidence, mm -hmm. a little assertion. And I think this ultimately will be healthy for good government. Now, I think that there's a couple things that, that uh, play, and I mean, I'm interested in your thoughts on this too, because nationally everybody realizes the economy is, there's a lot of inflation, price of fuel. I know uh, President Obama said his polling always tracked most closely with the price of fuel, and with the fuel going through the roof right now, setting record territory uh, all over the country and in Washington State too, that there's a strong negative feeling for the average people. So I know that that's a big issue, but you also have this crime wave that is pretty uh, significant, especially in the urban areas, and this homeless industrial complex kind of drug addiction issue that's all combined there, but that's creating absurd situations that you can't ignore or sweep under the rug because you just it's in your face. And then the schools, I think, which is really this kind of peeling back the veneer of the fact that maybe the schools are doing a good job. Those are the things I've seen out there that it seems to be shifting that middle, right? Those people Absolutely. that may have been apathetic. Is there anything else that uh, you see uh, when you're looking around the state? People are, the, the question of transparency uh, mm -hmm. in, in government in general here in Washington is m more on people's minds than it's been. I mean, people always talk about transparency in right. government, but I think the, the school issue, the K-12 public school issue, mm -hmm. has crystallized that for a lot of ordinary people in this state. Mm -hmm. And we talk about how normally they, they trust that the system will work. Well, normally people have trusted that the K-12 school system will do well for kids and, and give them a high quality education, right. as the state constitution requires the state government to provide. I think a combination of factors have changed that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, some of it was the, the distance learning, the remote learning during the COVID period. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it has to do with policy, mm -hmm. the controversial comprehensive sexual education requirements right. passed through Olympia. Uh, the combination of factors have many families, mm -hmm. uh, parents or sometimes grandparents who are raising their grandchildren, questioning the, the system more than they ever have. Are, right. are, are kids really getting uh, those fundamental learning skills right. that'll take them through life, and 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 we mean we mean reading, we mean good clear writing, we mean an understanding of hard math, right. we need an understanding of of, of hard sciences, biology, chemistry, right. physics, the things that make a, a person able to learn on his or her own, go out in the world, and whether it's college or or into a trade career right. or starting up a tech company to have those skills of critical thinking and knowledge base to go forward in life. I think families in Washington more than ever are saying, are we really getting that? Or are we getting a lot of fluff and kind of social engineering uh, right. that you know is fine, but is not what we send our kids to school to get? And we're paying a lot more now to do it than we ever did in the past. Uh, <laughs> I mean, $18,000 per kid per year, approximately. Right. right. And it's a lot of money. and. Uh, and, and frankly, the test scores and the performance of our schools has not kept up with the amount of money. In fact, it almost seems when I, and as a former school board member myself, and I'm married to a teacher, you know, and my kids are in public school right now, just looking at this increase in funding and almost a corresponding decrease in test scores where I think the last I saw, 70% of the kids in uh, Washington State right now are below literacy levels when it comes to math. Yeah, the, the math proficiency scores are very are troubling. particularly disastrous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and all these other, I mean, basically every measurement is, is bad. But when you're looking at the, you know, two out of three, 
are uh, being educated so poorly that uh, they're non-functional when it comes to the math skills. That's, that's not an indication of a, of a positive direction in education, even with the excuse of COVID and all the other things that people are going to try to throw out there. But. And, and this is not a criticism of the frontline teachers. They generally know that they're dealing with sure. trouble here. And they often know how they could do better, but there is a bureaucracy above them mm -hmm. kind of holding good teachers down, uh, making them do work that has nothing to do with teaching those essential skills, uh, filling them with the required trainings that are not right. relevant to helping kids. Right. Uh, if we can loosen up that, that, that bureaucratic weight on good teachers, I think we will see those scores coming back up again. Right. Well, and I do see, though, that, you know, what they, what they estimate about 45,000 parents or at least kids have been removed from the public school system. And, uh, and that's not by accident. That's, that's because yeah. they've made a conscious decision to change it. And even to the point that Chris Reichdahl, head of OSPI, right, the, our head superintendent of public education in the state, you know, saying that he wanted to restore funding to schools that had had all these kids leave. leave. And normally the funding in the state follows the kid. And this is an attempt to kind of divorce the funding. Uh, it's not just that they divorced it from whether they are learning anything, but let's even divorce it whether if they're there. Anything. Yeah, yeah. If they're, they're there at it all. It creates what some are calling ghost students, right, right? Where school districts are funded as if these students were still there and right. they're not, and they're ghost students. But uh, Glenn, I want to point out too that the education may be where people start their awakening, right? But it translates into other things that government does. Absolutely, yeah. And the first place I see it moving after education is one of the other things you mentioned, is this issue of homelessness and right. homeless housing. Right. I think in the same sense that people are not trusting and they're questioning public education when they have, which by the way is a healthy thing, yep. uh, they are beginning to question what we do about the homeless and how we've reached this place of, of such a chronic, persistent problem in homelessness. Right. And they're, they're not accepting the easy sound bites anymore, right. ordinary people. They're saying, well, I've heard that. You know, I've heard about give them housing first, right. and I see that's not working. There's got to be something else. Right, right. And I think that the key realization people are making there is something we've talked about here before. Homelessness is largely a drug and alcohol addiction right. problem. Right. Now, it's granted there are some other elements to it. But really, if you followed like the 80-20 rule of right. simplifying solutions, it, if you want to solve the 80% of the problem, it has to do with, with drug and alcohol addiction. Right. If we can address that more effectively, we can clean up these camps and we can get people off the streets living in horrible conditions. And I know there's an overlap there too with uh, recently the Safe Seattle uh, People Out, which is a, a group organized. Social media group. Se yeah, social media group organized up in Seattle and they were using drone footage of a supposed homeless camp that really was essentially a stolen vehicle chop shop operation Literally. in Seattle. Literally. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Like, and a sophisticated one, a big one. And you could see over the, they were flying, the, they, they were taking drone shots of all these people chopping cars and it, I was getting flashbacks when I was in college in New York City when pre-Giuliani during the Dinkins administration where I'd go on these runs um, on a run that I used to do on the cross country team and we would see all these guys every every day stripping cars down openly in these parks up in the Bronx. No, had no concern about law enforcement at all. And in this, these images I saw that they were posting from Seattle were bringing me back these memories of what I remember seeing as a college student. Yeah. And and I think that um, I think that this issue is really when we're talking about a red wave, which is what we're discussing here, that this is such a level of absurdity that. Um, who was it? Just recently talking to, I think Senator Fortunato mentioning uh, traveling around with some uh, some visitors here from uh, several African countries. Right, they came here and they were looking around Seattle and these homeless camps, and they were saying that that uh, you know that this is worse than the third world. It's country. worse than the third far world. far worse than the third world country. Yeah, it is a sophisticated black market economy, right? Which largely enables drug addicts. It's people. It's addicts. Uh, stealing to satisfy their addiction, right. but there's a, a whole world, a, a underground world, a black market world, and one of the things the red wave may do is wash out that black market world, right. and and really, the crime. When I look really at it, the, the yeah. organized crime, truly right, right. organized, right. And, um, and and from my perspective, the trick is we've got to get people off the street. Right. Where these people are living in squalid inhumane conditions, and you're right, it's worse than Calcutta, India. Right, it's right. worse than the classic notions of the third world. Right. It, it, it is, 
it's almost, a, it's like a, 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 a gulag. I mean, right. it's like a prison system that we're, in, we're forcing these poor people to live in. So and worse than that, we're funding all these nonprofits and NGOs and groups that come in and they say, Hell, hey, give us more money and we'll solve the uh, homeless issue. We'll right? make it a better gulag. Right, right. No, and, and, no, and, and, no. And, and, Let's get they, rid of it. And the more money you dump into it, the worse the problem gets. And I think that this, you know, all these things, you, you hear them from in, in different examples and different specifics, but uh, when you're around in Kent or Federal Way or, or Edmonds or, or Bellingham or Vancouver, mm -hmm. wherever you are in the state, and I know I, I'm seeing it everywhere. And so I feel like it's going to translate into some kind of different um, election sort of example. Now, there's, there's a lot of grassroots that watch my, my, my uh, channel here. A lot of them watch my videos. Um, if you had a message for grassroots activists who are trying to get involved, and maybe some of these people that put their name in the ballot and they jumped in, but they haven't really come up with a plan, uh, what would your recommendation be for people like that who, um, you know, they're not getting a lot of attention right now, right. But, they're, but they're on the ballot or they're trying to help somebody or they want to do something to help somebody? What would you tell them? Well, in every way of election, there are always some races, some campaigns that look like a long shot or a no shot that end up coming in. That right. person gets elected. And classically, the morning after, uh, it, it, you know, or November general election, all the gurus and smart guys and consultants say, well, we had that one pegged. Right. We had right. identified right. that yeah. as one that might work out. Right. And they're just bluffing. Right. They didn't know. Right. Um, so you could be, any one of you running, could mm -hmm. be that long shot that comes in in a wave election year. So don't think that you're just spinning your wheels. Right. Be the one, be the long shot who comes in. Be the one who shows up in Olympia in January, ready to write bills and pass bills. And that means that if you put your name on the ballot, and or you're going to help somebody who's who's running for office right now, even if you think it's a long shot race, don't just sit at home watching Netflix. I mean, get out there, run like you plan to win, and uh, and then of course, if you know if you're going to be a winner, you better be planning to govern. You know, winners have a plan to govern, and that's the and and, and there were going to be unexpected winners this November. I believe right. it and. Okay, let's talk. It's, it's a wave. The image right. we use is a wave. Well, be a good surfer. A good surfer doesn't just hang out waiting. Right. A good surfer paddles out, uses his or her judgment for catching the right wave, mm -hmm. and when the right wave comes, and I think this year is the right wave, We're on it. Yeah. you paddle like heck and you catch the wave. Right. Well, all that paddling, uh, that's your doorbelling. Right. That's your going to a... A, a, a rotary meeting. That's right. your public outreach. Run a serious campaign. Even right. if it's you're in a district which looks like it would be a long shot, pretend you're the incumbent. Right. Pretend you're winning. Right. And the wave may help you win. And that is far better than being the uh, dead fish floating in the ocean, you know, that maybe the tide carries you up, because I feel like that's kind of a, that's that's the attitude I'll hear sometimes from establishment, a little bit more establishment-oriented folk, and I, I um, always, that, that always bugs me, you know, get out there, work hard, and uh, make it happen, rather than just uh, hope that somehow the rain comes and it's just going to make you uh, successful. So, um, any other messages that you'd have for people just that you think that they should be aware of as we're going into what's essentially a really unusual um, uh, season, and certainly anybody who watched this video, I don't think any of us have really been in this kind of a, a political climate before. Well, you know, fortune favors the bold. Mm -hmm. Be bold. This is the time to mm -hmm. be bold. And you talk about the sort of passivity and the the timidness right. that establishment politicians of either party mm -hmm. often uh, feel, they exhibit, they, mm -hmm. they are wary, they're nervous about any change. Right. This is a change year, so mm -hmm. don't be those guys. Be the bold one, be the one who, who really takes advantage of this opportunity and turns it into cleaning up the streets, yeah. improving the schools making Washington a great place to do business again, right. which it hasn't been. I, I'm very worried that in all the rigmarole with the current governor and recent bad policy, we're chasing away the next Microsoft or the next Amazon, those businesses that catch fire that have been the engine of, of good economic growth in Washington. Right. We need the next Amazon. Right. And I'm not sure we've got it right now. But this is a beautiful place to live. Yep. It's great. Great people are here. Right. If we can just right the boat a little bit in, in Olympia, 
we can, this wave can help us restore Washington. So let's do that. Yeah, and you know, I mean, it's not, uh, the solution to every problem isn't necessarily political, but having a much better political environment is going to help solve a lot of those problems, I think, along the way, or at least create the climate where we can. Uh, boldness for those who've been timid. Yep. Humility for those who've been arrogant. That would be a good reform in Olympia. That is great. I think on that, I'm going to end because I can't top that one. Uh, so listen, if you've been, uh, I want to thank you, Jim, for coming in the studio today. This is a good topic. I hope, uh, I'm interested in your comments. If you have any about what you think is going on with this uh, wave election that we're in right now, what 2022 means to you with your local elections and uh, elections for the state legislature, where we're hoping to take back control with some level of sanity in there. Uh, and uh, so feel free to add your comments below. I do try to read them and I will respond to as many many of them, if not all of them, as, as possible. So I'm interested in what you have to say. And uh, if you want some other resources, I'll have that link down below in the video as well. Thank you so much for watching. And I'm going to close this video with everything that, with the same thing I say all the time. And it's very relevant to this conversation. Uh, the future does belong to those who show up.